be back here this week after having been away at General Council. My wife and I were gone in Columbus, and it was a great time. It really was a blessed time for us. And it's probably my, I think it's my fifth one that I've attended as a, an Alliance pastor. And every time I come back, so glad to be a part of this family that we call the Christian Missionary Alliance. It's, 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 a, it's fun and it's exciting what's going on around the world. One of the highlights of that time for me and for many is the, uh, the missionary rally, which uh, we have the international workers carry the flags. And it's a visual, really, of all the work over the years that, that the Alliance has, has been a part of. And, and uh, of course, then, the, then there comes the commissioning of uh, new workers to the field. And we send, I don't know how many it was. There probably, I don't know, you know, Lynn, I don't know, it was probably a dozen or or so that went out. But there was a, it was a bunch that went out again this year, new places of the world, some of the difficult spots, some of the more creative places, and uh, some places they couldn't even share where they were going because it was dangerous for them. And so it's, it's exciting because they're taking, take, we're taking the gospel to new places, places where there isn't a gospel witness right now. And so it's fun to be a part of that. That's, that's who we are as a, an Alliance Church. We're part of that mission, that movement to bring the gospel to the world. And uh, I certainly love that. It's exciting. And uh, just wanted to share that because that's, that's a lot of fun for me. And also part of council that's also a lot of fun for me is it, it tends to be a time when God reminds me of things. He challenges me in things, opens my mind and eyes to things that I have been thinking or praying about that I haven't, for whatever reason, when I'm here, had space to hear it. Well, so, um, so that's part of that as well. And often you, the church family here, would come up to my mind as I'd pray for you or I'd, I'd just be encouraged by you and, and just as people that I want to lead well and be a part of uh, well. So I'm glad to be here in this church as well. That's a good thing. And so I'm excited for all those things. So today, what I wanted to do, I was going to get back into Joseph this week, but I, I, the Lord, you know, he does that. He changes minds and all that. So we're going to be in Acts. And the reason is because when I was at council, one of the things he showed me was the, this message here I wanted to share with you this morning. Something that's on my heart I want to share, a little conversation this morning, okay? A little bit about, about how the Lord has, uh, I think, challenged me and perhaps is challenging us as a church. So we're going to go to Acts chapter 4, and uh, starting in verse 8, I'm going to read through verse 22. We'll walk through this together here. We'll get back to, we'll finish Joseph. I know we're like at the kind of the climax of the story there, if you've been following along. But we'll get back to Joseph next week. Acts 4, starting in verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed." He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men no longer to, to, uh, to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Now, a little backstory, right? This man, for 40 years, has not been able to walk. And we see in previous texts here before this that he had been carried to the temple gate every day and sat there and he'd beg. And people would walk by the religious people, the people going to pray in the the, 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 the synagogue there. They would... 
they would see him there and they would walk right by. Or maybe throw a few coins at him and walk right by. And one day Peter and John walk past and they notice this guy and they pay attention to this guy and they offer him more than money. They offer him Jesus Christ. And they say, we, we don't have money, but we've got something better. And they offer him Jesus Christ. He receives Jesus. He's healed. He picks up his mat and he starts running around praising God. Now, imagine if that's something that you saw every day and now listen, this guy is running around praising God. What would happen? We would notice. And so the crowd gathers. They start to talk. And then Peter, seeing an opportunity to share the gospel, talks about Jesus. This is what happened, he says. This is, this is the one you rejected. And this is the one who has healed this guy. Well, the religious leaders also noticed. And they were all kinds of nervous about this. Like, really nervous. Like, this can't be. We can't control this. This is, this is beyond our scope and our view. And so that's kind of where we're at today. They got brought in in front of the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish ruling council there, and they are told to stop. You guys are disrupting the peace. You can't do that. And so they're interrogated. Now, what they don't anticipate, though is that Peter and John are not acting in some religious expression or some politically motivated way. They're not coming with an agenda of their own. They're not selling their books. You know, they're, not, they're not on some sort of tour to really make themselves elevated. They are living a Holy Spirit-filled, a Holy Spirit-empowered life. And they're just letting it come out. They're just living it out. They're doing what we're supposed to be doing. It's incredible because they want people to encounter Christ so they can be saved. They're not worried about the religious leaders. Let them get mad. And so as I heard stories at council about all the, the ways God is working around the world, and in some very extraordinary ways, I thought this over and over again, that ordinary people do extraordinary things when they're empowered by the Holy Spirit. We say extraordinary, of course, because in our mind we don't understand it, but it's, it, to God it's like everyday living, right? Ordinary people like you and like me. I was, I was uh, at a meeting and, and we ran into the guy who was my youth pastor and his wife. He's now serving in uh, Germany. But uh, it was interesting because all these memories come back. You know, you, you see these people and I haven't seen them for years and memories come back and I started thinking about, you know, that is really my story as well. Because I didn't come from a line of pastors. I was the first one. I was at my family line on either side in some ways. There's a line, line of drunks, outlaws, brokenness in families. My uncle is serving a prison time in Wisconsin for, for crimes, um, all kinds of different crimes. And it was the longest sentence ever handed down in the state of Wisconsin for that particular crime. And uh, when they... Um, when they announced it on the news, I was in like middle school, they got his name wrong, thankfully, because I didn't really want to own up to that. But that's just, you know, as a part of your, the family that I'm a part of, but I was just a young boy, grown up in small town Wisconsin, had no concept in my mind that there was anything bigger than just here and now. I mean, as a kid, you don't think about that probably much anyway. I would go to church because it's what we did on Sunday. Didn't want to go. Would try to talk my parents out of it. Had no thought of doing anything for God. No thought of even that was a, something I could ever do. No personal connection with Jesus. None. But, but then, you know, God interrupts your life, right? And uh, Jesus, you know, I met, met Jesus in a tree house on a summer afternoon, you know. And, and I prayed to receive him and he, be, he became my savior and uh, things changed. Now, that sounds cliche, but it really, things changed. I, saw, I went and found my Bible. I, I didn't know where it was. I found it. I started reading it. I, I started getting involved in the church there. I went to the Alliance Church. That's why the Alliance is so dear to me, because it was where I was really developed in, in the, the faith. I would go there for every service. They had two services. I'd go to the first service, Sunday school, and the second service, because I was so hungry. I'm not telling you this because you say, oh, look at him. My point is, I was so hungry for, for, teeth, for, for God's word, for the teaching, for the fellowship of the believers, that I, I had to be there. And so I was talking to them, and this is all coming back to my mind, and she, with my youth pastor's wife, Jen, went, with tears in her eyes, she looks at me and says, I just love your story. And I thought, well, I forgot about my story. 
forgot about how God had taken it, somebody just ordinary, you know, and done something extraordinary and taken me places I'd never dreamed. She says, you know, you could have gone either way. And she's right. And that's probably all of us, right? You could have gone either way. And here we are, God by his grace. And so all this stuff in my mind, right? So I'm standing next to all these international workers who have gone and have given their lives going to places, people like, uh, well, I could name a bunch, but people who have, in, some of them have lost people to been martyred, family members. And they're giving their lives to take this gospel message to the nations, giving up everything in America and going someplace remotely because Jesus told them to go. And I think, how am I standing in any way with these people? How, how am I even a part of that? That's what God does, Right? Extraordinary things. Ordinary people being used by him and filled with the Holy Spirit. It was exciting. I was re- reading through the, uh, the reports this year. And, and John Stumb was the Alliance president. And he, he made this comment. He said, I, I wish you could have been with me at the national office in Colorado Springs when a tour came through. There were 40 Hmong uh, individuals who came to see us. And well, I was eager to greet them in my office. They didn't understand why such a large group was traveling together. And so he asked them, and they said, we're from Minnesota. They, uh, they explained, this is a family reunion. But why did you choose Colorado Springs? He said, he, pointing to the eldest person in the room, they explained, it was grandmother's wish to see the office of the Christian Missionary Alliance before she died because it was the alliance that first brought the gospel to our people. It's, a, it's just an incredible thing. Around the world, we, we were seeing this kind of thing happen over and over again. And uh, our staff around the world, 82%, 82% of our global staff are in places that are least underreached places in terms of the gospel. So we need intentional efforts to go and all that stuff, and we'll continue to talk about that and pray for that and lean into what God's doing. But I want to go back to the text now because I think this has something to do with us, too as this demonstrates what a spirit-filled life really looks like and that we're made for more than, than just kind of this boring religious activity. Right? We're made for more than that. We're made for something more exciting than that. In relationship with a living Savior, nothing more exciting and more compelling than that. That's a journey that we all want to be on. There's life there. So the first piece of this spirit-filled life Right out of this text is this, and this idea of, of boldness. We talked about that a little bit. Boldness. You're given boldness. Peter is on trial for healing a crippled man. Okay? It's like... And he says to them, he says, he says I mean, am I being put on trial for an act of kindness to a, a crippled guy? You guys hear yourself? Does it even make any sense? But see, then it, it lets us know here in the text what's really behind this. It says in that moment, in verse 8, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit to say to them these words. And he spoke these words, these spirit-empowered, spirit-filled words. Not something he just went, well, here's my answer. No, have you ever been in that place when someone asks you a question and it's like, I don't know how to answer this question. Oh, Lord, help me answer this question. And I've been there and I've heard the words that have come out of my mouth and I went, boy, you babbling fool, you know. They don't, it doesn't make any sense what you just said. And somehow the Spirit of God takes that and, and uses it in a life. And they understand it. It's incredible. God, He uses willing vessels like you and me and takes us to places that we never dreamed of. He'll allow us to speak words that matter in a situation when we don't understand what to even say or how to answer. If we're open to it, scriptures come to mind, testimonies of God's work in your life that you feel compelled to share. We just need to ask Him to direct our steps and to fill us and to just be willing to say it when it comes up. Be willing to speak it. Peter makes it very clear here in verse 11 what this is about. He says, He is the stone you builders rejected. He goes back to the Old Testament scriptures and he says, remember the Messiah that was to come? That's the guy that you guys just killed. And that's the guy that has made this guy walk. The cornerstone, the one you're going to build your life and your nation on is the one in whom we're to trust. Verse 13, it says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John 
and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. You see the result of being with Jesus? is a boldness. They recognized in the lives of these guys that they had been with Jesus. Now, let's just kind of dwell on that for a second. They're not offended by what he said necessarily. They're astonished, it says. They're astonished at the power that is pouring out of them. That they just cannot be contained. And they go, well, you know, he, hey, they, he, they've been with Jesus. That must be the, the key. And so I dare say, and I wonder in my own life sometimes, that how much is missed in our own lives? How much work of the Holy Spirit are we missing out on because we're not spending time with Jesus? And I'm talking to myself, just like anybody else. Okay? Jesus said He's the living water, He's the bread of life, He's the great shepherd of the sheep. How dare we think we could do something without Him? So we need to be with Him. We need to allow Him to shape us. And when it does... People notice, as it says in the text, they noticed he had been with Jesus and they see his works and they, they, they worship him. I pray every week, and I still do this, I, at least one time during the week I'll come through and pray through the sanctuary. And I do this because I want us to encounter Jesus when we come here. I really do. I really pray that way. I pray that you do encounter him and I hope that, that you are. Because um, there's a lot of distractions I mean, it, there's a lot of things that get in our, our way. We, we might c- be concerned, like, oh my. My kids are too loud. or whatever. Don't worry about all those things, right? We, all, all of us have a part to play. All of us are valuable to God. And you being here matters. And I do pray that way. But you know, we, we sing songs. We, we make worship a priority in our life. We come before the Lord and say, Lord, I, I need you. And then, and then we get propelled out into the world to do something exciting with it. Another thing we notice here is formal training is not required. I love that because that's sometimes a, a crutch that I've used before. In verse 13, he says, uh, they were unschooled, ordinary men. They didn't have seminary training, didn't parse Greek verbs, didn't debate the five points of Calvinism. You know, no books written. They were empowered with the Spirit. And that was, that was it. That was all they needed. So I guess the thing is, don't write yourself out of the story, okay? And say, well, I'm not ready, I'm not trained, I don't have the right words, I don't have the right training, I don't know how to share my faith with anybody. We can do this in churches too and compare ourselves to each other. Well, look what that church is doing. and you know, it's All that stuff, who cares? What is the Spirit leading us to do? What is the Spirit leading you to do? Who is He leading you to reach? Kids and adults alike, all of us are included in that. And there's a foundation here, right? Verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Foundation is the salvation that is in Christ alone. The church does not exist primarily for those of us who are believers. And, uh, you know, sometimes we think of it that way. Churches are supposed to be offering hope to a broken world, looking outside of our walls, reaching those unreached, because the church is not a building, right? It's not a building. It's, a, it's people united by faith in Christ. That's why the more I'm in ministry and the more I'm doing this, the more I, I understand and realize that the most effective ways we reach people is through these relationships that we have. Our, our own lives. We go to work. We go to our homes. We go in the community and we're a part of things. And we are carriers of that message. And so as we go out, that's... Now, ministry programs are helpful, I'm not saying we throw them all away. What I'm saying is, is that we need to be engaged. It's His church. It's His mission. We're called to join with Him. And there's urgency to that because, of course, people die every day without Jesus. And so, that's the first one. Boldness, okay? A little boldness is a good thing. Next, we see miracles take place. Miracle, the miracle in the text here, we cannot ignore the miracle because after 40 years, this guy is walking. And that's a pretty significant deal. But the religiously structured mind couldn't understand that. Could it? it didn't again get that. This guy is walking, and where's the trick? You know, what, where, where's the smoke and mirrors? Verse fourteen, it says, "But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. They they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, and then they conferred. They didn't know what to make of this. Can you just kind of picture these guys like just baffled by this whole thing, like?" 
This doesn't make any, this does not fit in a religious schematic. It doesn't work. People don't get healed like this. But the sign points right to Jesus. It just points right back to him. And, and it's unfortunate that in our day and age we've seen so many people abuse this um, with various ways, um, preachers that have abused this area, that there's so much skepticism on it. But the thing is, is that Jesus is able to do anything. He's not limited by anything. This points right to him, and, it, and, and the power is still available today. I mean, it's, it hasn't changed. So we need the power of Jesus Christ among us. Because when he works, the world cannot deny it. That's what it says. They, they didn't have anything to say. There was nothing they could say. Because the proof was right there and it stood the test. It didn't just, wasn't just like an adrenaline rush. It was like this guy was legitimately healed and there was nothing they could say. Nothing. And the religious have no answer for this work. And it's kind of like those times when we've heard, or maybe you've had a story like this where... Uh, you've had some, something going on physically and you've gone to the doctor after praying for it and it's like, the doctor goes, well, I don't understand. You know, before it was here and now it's not. And, and, you're, and they're going, well, your body must adapt it. You know, it must have adapted. And we go, nope, that's not what it is. It's the power of Jesus in me, my healer who has touched my body. It baffles people. So the question then is this, why do we limit how we pray? Why do we limit how we pray? I've been there before. I've done this before. This kind of perfunctory prayer where someone desires something. They're asking, hey, I want to be healed. And I'll, we'll pray, well, God, thank you for this day. And, you know, pray for these things. And, but, they, I mean, pray for doctors. I get that. But pray to be healed. That's what, he, what, they, what they want to be, be healed. God can do his work how he wants. But we pray that he can heal because he can. Pray for health. Pray for addictions to be broken. Pray for minds to be free. Pray for the, the people in Battle Lake to hear and re, uh, respond to the gospel. Big things, big prayers that only He can do because we need Him to show up. We can't do it on our own. So we're going to stop limiting Him. Finally, there's one more here that I, I wanted to share, and that's this, this whole idea of being captivated. They were so captivated by Christ that they couldn't stay silent. There was no way to keep Him silent. They tried. They had no idea what to do. Verse 17, But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Stop talking, they said. No sharing. Then they called him and again to speak, and they commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. So that's what, they really didn't have any way to stop him. They just said, stop talking. No, no more sharing this Jesus with anybody. And then they answer, verse 19, Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right for in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. We cannot help it. Such a moving of the Spirit cannot be contained. Can't be contained. I was reading in a devotional this week, the Emotionally Healthy Spiritually something, I don't know, it's, a, it's a daily office, but it's a new name. Anyway, if you're familiar with that. God's presence, he said, in us is like the fire in the burning bush. It gradually takes us over so that although we remain fully ourselves, we are being made over into our true selves the way God originally intended us to be. We never lose our identity, but we are filled with God like a sponge is filled with water. I love that image. Jesus loved that image, that, that being filled like a sponge. And that's why Paul said in Romans 15, chapter, verse 13, he said, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't want to trickle, you know. We don't want just to be kind of wet. We want to be saturated. So, so he pours out of us. I get the, the image of the sponge, right? So just try to hold a sponge that's saturated and don't let it drip, right? It, it does just kind of comes out of there. It has to come out. And that's the way it is. That's the way it must be. Now, if that's not enough, oh, there is another good picture, right? It's overflowing with hope. But if that's not enough, we see this in verse 21. Of course, I turned the page. There you go. Verse 21. Further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God. Now, let, check that out. That, that's very interesting. They could not decide what to do because all the people were praising God for what had happened. The church was worshiping God for what he had done 
And the leaders were so captivated and so expressive in this, like God had done this, Jesus is alive, and he's touched this guy's life, that they had, they had no, nothing else to do. The church was being the church, the church was worshiping God, and they couldn't contain the work of the Spirit. And as soon as this happened, the testimony of the church as a worshiping body of believers was sufficient, and they went, well, I don't, I don't know what to do. So, and they walked away. Isn't that amazing? It's just an authentic, authentic, captivated life that just is overflowing with the Spirit of God. So you can't contain the work of the Spirit. So I'm at council this year, thinking about all this, like I said, and God has reminded me, and there's a lot of themes this year, a lot of talk about the Holy Spirit being filled with the Spirit and, and all those things. And I, I kept getting this, this message in my heart that said, you know, it's, it's really, it's time, right? The, the, the church in America, the church here in Battle Lake, it's time for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit again, to be, to be overflowing with His Spirit. To break the mold, to relinquish control, to say, Jesus, we need more of you, and to be authentic about that desire. I came here two years ago almost now, and I came, and I've shared before, I was very deeply wounded when I showed up here by a previous church ministry and some things that happened. And I was very hesitant. I'm very honest. I was very hesitant because I didn't want to get hurt again. You know, you've been there. And so I, you take a little time. You, you kind of put your feet in slowly. You don't, you don't know, if, is it going to happen again? Is this safe? But again, it's, it's time you know, jump, to jump in. Because Jesus wants to open the floodgates. He wants to do things in our lives, in our ministry, in our church, in our community. And he wants us to be a part of that. Isn't that exciting? The, the stuff in Acts is not just like, oh, that's... Bible stuff. No, that's, that can happen today. I mean, this stuff is taking place today, and we want to be a part of that. And so, um, he, so it's time for the church to uh, take its place in the communities that they are planted in and to be that beacon of light and hope to lost people, to, to have a fresh encounter with Christ. We need that every day. It can be easy to get kind of comfortable and routine and to say, well, I'm, I'm doing all right. You know, I love God. I, I say my prayers. I go to church sometimes. I put my money in all those things. But are you willing to overflow? So there's a bigger, there's a bigger life. Jesus said he came come to give us life abundantly, right? It wasn't just life and boring life. Life abundantly. An exciting journey with him. And so are you willing to say yes? I'm willing to jump in. I want you to do something new in me. I want you to do something new in my family, something new in our church, something new in our community. Lord, just use me, make me a willing vessel. That's all of our parts to play. It's not just my job, it's all of us together as a church. It's those that are, aren't a part of this body, other, just us as the church, that we would say, yes, Jesus, I, I want to be used by you as a willing vessel to further your kingdom here in this place, however that looks. Because the community needs expressions of the gospel, doesn't it? Everywhere. Not just in the buildings of the churches, but also in our backyard barbecues, in our conversations, in our workplaces, everywhere we go. It's exciting when you think that way. Like, how can, I, how can I be a blessing today? How can I share the love of Jesus today in my words and in my deeds? How can I pray for someone or encourage someone or just, just let Jesus be made known in my life today? How can that happen? How fun is that? But, of course, boldness is needed. Openness is needed. That the Spirit of God is is who we need. So I want to take a moment here to have you just uh, take a time in your own heart and respond to him. Are you willing to jump in? Are you wanting to say, I want more of you? And if that's you, just take this, just tell him, oh, sp- fill me. I, I want to be filled. I want to be used by you, Lord. Light that fire again in my heart. So at some point in our life, we, you know, we drift Amen. Lord, we do ask you in, in this moment, however that looks in each heart here, God, God we, we desire more of you. 
We desire that for the sake of our community and the sake of the people who have not heard your message, Lord, light that, that fire inside of me, inside of us, that we would be bearers of this message of Jesus to everyone we meet. Do something new in, in me. Do something new in us, new in our church, in the lives of the people here, that we would be overflowing with the hope that you've given. It's not something we make up. It's not something we're trying to manufacture. We, we need you. We sang that already today as well, that we need you. Every hour, I need you. Lord, take that and seal it into our hearts today as, as we in a moment come to this time at the table. And we're reminded that we need you. That we can't do this on our own. That you've called us to a mission that's far greater than our hands can, can, can do. Needs that are bigger. That people would, would be freed from addiction, be freed from, from sin and bondage and all kinds of, of illnesses and, and needs. Lord, do a work among us that would call people to faith in you. We're excited about that, Lord. I believe you've got some things in mind for us as we submit, and I pray that you would lead us in that way. Lord, come. Thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray all these things. Amen. We uh, we will come to the.